said, now that we're done talking about the general overview of the different scales of circulation, this lecture we're going to cover global circulation models. Now, these are important because these are the single biggest cause of climate. So if you've ever wondered why it rains in your area, why it doesn't rain in your area, why are there deserts in some places and tropical rainforest in others? Well, hopefully we can kind of uncover that a little bit today. Now, with that said, everything I'm talking about today, because it's global scale, it just represents the average situation. It represents the average airflow around the world. There is a little bit of variation from season to season and day to day. But for the most part, what I'm going to present to you today is actually pretty good. And it does a really good job explaining large scale circulations. Now, how does this all begin with? It all begins with one important fact, and I hope that you've learned this by now in this, in this course. The Earth is heated unevenly. We have a planet with a, that, that spins on a tilted axis, different land covers, different angles that the sunlight comes in, different latitudes, um, land versus ocean, different elevations. All of these things greatly influence how much heat a location gets. This creates very uneven heating. And as I've said hundreds of times before, Mother Nature hates imbalance. And as a result, global circulations are just one attempt, just one attempt at evening all of this out. Let's talk about this. Now, a few lectures ago, I talked about something called a model. Well, we're doing models again here. And let me just stress that again, models are simplifications. Basically, we're taking all the nasty, hard to work with, and mostly insignificant stuff about the Earth and getting rid of it. So we can just focus on the main patterns at play. Now, because this isn't a one-to-one -one representation, there is some variation that goes on, but don't worry too much about that. So let's talk about this. The first model I'm going to introduce to you is what's called the single-celled model. This model is useful for describing just the very basics of atmospheric circulation. And it, it has some uses, but you're going to find that it also has some limitations. So here's how this model works. First, no tilt. As a result, the sun is always directly over the equator. Second, the earth is flat and it's uniformly covered with water. And when I say flat, I don't mean flat as in flat earthers. I mean flat as in it's, it's a smooth sphere, meaning there's no mountains, no differences in elevation, nothing that could cause any big friction. It's just flat and uniformly covered with water. The last thing, that, the last simplification that we make is that the Earth does not rotate. So we're not going to worry about the Coriolis force here. We're not going to worry about friction here. We're only worried about the pressure gradient force. Now I know what you're thinking, but wait a second. Doesn't that mean that the sun would just roast one area and the other area would be cold? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of true, but let's not worry about that. This is just a model. So here's how the single cell model would look like. In the case that the sun is directly over the equator, the air over the equator would be very hot. As we all know already, hot air rises. On the other hand, the areas near the poles are going to be very cold. And we all know that cold air sinks. So in a very real sense, we have just constructed a two column model here. We have a warm, tall column over the equator and a cold, short column over the poles. Now I'm going to skip some of the extra steps involved 
But what I do want you to know is that this leads to low pressure at the surface over the equator, high pressure at the surface over the poles. And it also leads to this circulation where as air rises over the equator, that creates high pressure aloft. As air sinks over the pole, that creates low pressure aloft. And so you get this circulation that develops. Air rises over the equator, travels up to the pole, sinks at the pole, travels back down to the equator. And this creates this large circulation that we call a Hadley cell. So this whole lap of this air from rising at the equator, traveling to the pole, sinking at the pole, traveling back to the equator, is a Hadley cell. Now, you can kind of see a few limitations with this, but believe it or not, this is actually a somewhat decent representation of our planet. Here's why. There actually is a persistent band of low pressure systems near the equator. We call this band the inner tropical convergence zone. I'm going to talk more about it in a few minutes. So if you don't have it written down now, you're okay. Meanwhile, we actually have persistent high pressure systems at the poles. These are called polar high pressure systems. However, what happens between the equator and the poles is still very much a mystery. And so we want to be able to uncover what on earth is going on here. Well, in order to do that, we have to take this extremely crude model and we have to add one complexity. And believe it or not, we only have to add one complexity. So we only have to change one thing. And we're going to get a much better representation of Earth's circulation. Here's what we do. What we do is we take our single-celled model and we rotate it. We take our Earth and we rotate it. Everything else is the same still uniformly covered with water, still sun directly over the equator. We'll talk about that in a few moments, but we just bring rotation back into the mix. This brings the Coriolis force back into the mix. And by bringing the Coriolis force into the mix, we theoretically split this single Hadley cell into three different cells. Now, there's still many similarities to the single cell model, and they're the good similarities. Tropics still get most of the heat. They still have the low pressure systems. The poles are the coldest. They still have the high pressure systems. But the three cell model helps us to understand what happens between the equator and the poles. Here's what happens. What happens is that Hadley cell that spanned all the way from the equator to the poles now only goes as far as 30 degrees north. After 30 degrees north, it begins to sink. The air in this Hadley cell begins to sink back down to the earth. This creates a band of high pressure systems at 30 degrees north. Now, if you recall from our previous lecture, or from our, our previous module, high pressure systems are areas of divergence. Here you have sinking air, wind that is diverging, and you actually have very calm and dry weather. Well, the world's largest deserts exist right around 30 degrees north, including the Sahara Desert, including the desert southwest, us here in uh, the United States, areas such as Phoenix are near 30 degrees north. Um, the Atacama Desert in South America, one of the driest locations in the world, is located near 30 degrees south. And this is all because high pressure dominates those regions. High pressure dominates those regions.
Now, between 30 degrees and 60 degrees, a new cell develops called the feral cell. Along the feral cell, we have sinking air at 30 degrees and rising air at 60 degrees. And at 60 degrees, we get another band of low pressures called the, called the polar front. Now, we're going to talk more about this polar front in the next lecture when we talk about jet streams, but you want to know about it now because it's actually where our storm track is. Many of the mid-latitude cyclones that we get here in North America span from this polar front. Finally, between 60 degrees and 90 degrees, we have a final cell called the polar cell. Air rises at 60 and sinks at 90. And therefore we have that polar high again. Here's what I really want you to take from this right now. We have low pressure at the equator, down here, high pressure at 30 degrees, low pressure at 60, and high pressure at 90. Everything else we'll talk more in depth about, but I want you to understand that. Okay, now that you understand that, let's actually talk a little bit about wind flow at different latitudes. So, we know that winds blow from high to low. That was from our last module. So, winds are blowing from these 30 degree subtropical highs down towards the equator where this intertropical convergence zone is present. As winds are traveling from 30 down to the equator, they begin to deflect to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere, creating this pretty strong band of east to west winds called the trade winds. also known as the trades. So these are called the trades. And they blow from east to west near the equator. Now, between 30 degrees and 60 degrees, winds are also blowing from high to low. Now they're blowing towards 60 degrees, and again, they deflect to the right of their path in the northern hemisphere, or to the left of their path in the southern hemisphere. What this creates is a band of west to east winds called the westerlies. Sorry. These are what are called the westerlies. As you can tell, my penmanship on here isn't the greatest, but eh, we'll make do with it. Between 30 and 60 degrees, winds blow from west to east. Believe it or not, we live here in California, we live in this region, and we actually experience winds that blow from west to east. As a matter of fact, most of the storm systems that we get in the wintertime come from the Pacific Ocean, and they blow from west to east. Most of our weather doesn't usually come from inland. No, it comes from the ocean. And this is because of the westerlies. And then finally, between 60 and 90, we get what are called polar easterlies. These I'm not as worried about. I want you to know more about the trades and the westerlies. Now, how does our atmosphere actually look like compared to this three-celled model? Well, here's how it looks like. In January, we know that the sun is not directly over the equator in January. Rather, it's a little further to the south. As a result, this band of low pressures is a little bit further to the south. But if you take a look, other than that, the circulation actually checks out pretty well. You've got a band of low pressure near the equator. You've got these high pressure systems 
near 30 degrees, and you have these low pressure systems near 60 degrees. Again, there's some variation due to land cover, due to the position of the sun, but for the most part, this three-celled model actually explains our atmosphere very well. In July, now the sun is over the northern hemisphere, and so that band of low pressures, the intertropical convergence zone, is now present over the northern hemisphere. But still, you get those high pressure systems that are near 30 degrees north, you get low pressure systems closer to 60 degrees north, and so on. Something else you get, especially in the northern hemisphere because there's a lot of land, you get what are called thermal low pressures that develop. Now, we're not going to talk too much about those today, but those are simply caused by the fact that the air is really hot, therefore it rises and it produces low pressure. But again, other than that, we're not going to focus on them. Now, in between each one of these cells, we have two different jet streams that are formed. We have the subtropical jet stream, which forms between the equator and 30, and the polar jet stream between the mid-latitudes and the polar regions. Now, we're not going to talk much about this subtropical jet stream, but I do want to talk a little bit more about this polar jet stream. Now, the polar jet stream is a band of extremely fast wind in the upper atmosphere. And it's present at approximately 10 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. This jet stream acts as a boundary between warm air from the equator and cold air with the poles. The reason why this happens is, going back to the two column model, yep, very fundamental model, so if you forgot it, go back and rewatch that lecture. Going back to the two column model, Near the surf, or sorry, um, near the equator, you have lots of warm air. Therefore, you have a tall column. Near the equator, or sorry, near the poles, ugh, near the poles, you have a lot of cold air and a much shorter column. So, in the upper atmosphere, winds are blowing this way. However, the Coriolis force kicks in and it steers those winds this way. Now, the greater the difference between this warm air near the equator and this cold air near the poles, the stronger the jet stream. So the stronger the difference between this warm air mass near the equator and this cold air mass near the poles, the stronger the jet stream. Now this has an interesting implication. If you've ever wondered why the weather is a lot calmer in the summertime here in California, why we don't get rain, why we don't get any kind of storms, why do we only get that stuff in the wintertime? Well, it has to do with the fact that during the summertime, the difference between these two air masses, this warm air mass to the south, and this cold air mass to the north isn't very great. Therefore, we don't really have a strong jet stream. Also, the warm air mass is much further north than it is during the winter time. Therefore, this jet stream is much further to the north in the winter time. As a result, we don't get the same storm track during the summertime that we do during the winter time. And that's why we don't get rain here in the summertime. The jet stream's a lot weaker because the difference between warm and cold air masses is a lot smaller. And therefore, we just don't get the kind of storms we get during the winter time. Whereas during the winter time, this warm air mass is still very warm, whereas this cold air mass is extremely cold. Therefore, there's a big temperature difference Therefore, there's a big pressure difference. Therefore, there's a big jet stream difference. And we get a stronger jet stream and a much, much stormier weather pattern.
it looks something like this. Now, if you recall from the last lecture or the last module that we talked about, we mentioned something called geostrophic balance. In the upper atmosphere, the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force balance each other out. Well, when you're near the surface of the Earth, the difference in pressures between warm air and cold air, between this warm column and cold column, is very small. And in fact, if you recall from the two column model, until these winds get going, the pressures are pretty much the same. However, the higher up you go, the greater the pressure difference. The greater the pressure difference, the stronger the wind. That's why these jet streams are very fast in the upper levels of the troposphere. And they're very slow near the surface of the Earth. It's because the difference between the two pressures is very small near the surface, and it's much greater aloft. So, so small difference. Let me try this actually. Small difference. I'm just going to say diff. Whereas up here, large difference. And as you can tell, I probably need to take a course on how to operate a mouse. But anyway, that's why the winds blow faster aloft. Now we care about this jet stream again because this is where storm systems blow. And we can identify the jet stream on a weather map by looking at the 300 millibar level. At the 300 millibar level, wherever the winds are blowing really fast, so up here, and wherever these height lines are very close together, that is where the jet stream is located. So over here, the winds are blowing very weak. You don't see any shadings. This isn't the jet stream. Whereas up here, these height lines are closer to each other, and the winds are blowing a lot stronger. That is where the jet stream is. Now just a quick review from this module. Um, there are two models of global circulation, the single cell model, which is a very crude but good introductory model, and then the three cell model. From the three cell model, if you have to limit what you remember, what I want you to remember is low pressure is present at the equator and at 60 degrees. High pressure is present at 30 degrees and the poles. And then finally, the jet stream is a boundary between warm air towards the pole, cold air, or that, ah, let me rephrase that, warm air towards the equator, cold air towards the pole. And this creates a strong storm track. It's much stronger and more intense in the wintertime, much weaker in the summertime. That's it for this module. In the next module, we're gonna talk about ocean currents El Nino and La Nina kind of uncover some of those ideas.